So uh, this is kind of a fun talk to give. Uh, usually, you know, I'm a wildlife biologist by training. That's the, the line in the resume. And so it's usually talks about, come on in. Usually get to give talks about bird identification and land management practices and all those things. Uh, because people see that I'm a wildlife biologist, they ask me to do that stuff. But in all honesty, and the people that I work with know this, I'm actually kind of a bad wildlife biologist. Um, I really have a lot more interest in uh, kind of the human side of, of conservation and, and the challenges in the, on the human landscape and, and how we address them and how we uh, uh, work through some of those solutions. And I think really in a lot of ways it's something that the, the conservation community is focusing more and more on and, and looking at how social science as opposed to just uh, ecological sciences and, and biology can inform our decision making and the work we do out there. So uh, I'm actually going to give a talk on some social science uh, concepts and, and ideas and, and, uh, and hopefully Maybe just give a little bit of insight, inform, uh, interest you in uh, in some of those social sciences and how they can make us better at uh, uh, delivering conservation on the ground. So, to highlight the the reason why we we need to think this way is uh, pretty clear when you look at land ownership. And we've heard about this quite a bit already today, but uh, uh, we really uh, are, have no other choice, uh, and, and it's not a bad choice to have, but. Uh, we really have no option other than working with private landowners throughout these landscapes that we're trying to preserve. And so uh, when you look at the United States, this is land ownership. All those colors are showing basically some kind of government uh, at varying levels, whether it's local, state, or private. And when we look at the central grasslands, the prairie states, the whatever we else calls the flyover states, we see that it's almost entirely private. And you guys know this. This is no, no surprise. There's very few federal uh, or even state land holdings uh, in, uh, in Texas and Oklahoma. So basically all the good work that we talk about, all the good work that we want to see done on the landscape uh, is going to be done by those folks that own that land, those private landowners. And so uh, we have to be working through them. Uh, we have to uh, uh, work with them to realize those sort of objectives. And uh, I just have to click it. All right, so uh, we should really look at that as a as a privilege more than anything. Uh, these folks are uh, uh, have an incredible knowledge base and have uh, uh, quite a bit of, of ability. Uh, but to to work with these folks and uh, and, and to uh, consider them just as much of a uh, an interesting topic as we do the critters and the, the wildlife that's out there, we should we should think about the the vast array of, of science that uh, that informs. Uh, decision making uh, when it comes to private land ownership. So, as Ben mentioned, um, I have a, a background up in Montana and Wyoming working on uh, sage grouse and uh, oil and gas uh, development uh, conflict and, and the issues that arose from that. And uh, really, I went up there to be a, a grizzly bear biologist. That was my first goal, but I realized that there's literally like one grizzly bear biologist in the entire country. His name is Chris Servine, he uh, works at the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so I figured if I wanted to actually have a job when I got out, I'd do something else. So I went up and studied sage grouse. And uh, I had the you know, bright ideas of you know, I was going to go up there, I was going to you know, peer into the soul of these, of these ranchers and landowners and tease out what it takes to, to you know, save the world and solve these big conservation issues. And uh, it didn't matter that I was you know, wearing the wrong shoes, driving my Volkswagen Jetta down there to uh, you know, talk to rural <laughs> ranchers um, about a, an issue like endangered species, oil and gas, conservative ranchers, what could go wrong, right? So, um, but it was a lot of fun, and actually they, they're, they're, they were wonderful people, and they were wonderful to me, and had a lot of fun down there. And so, uh, what I really looked at was uh, the, the science of uh, looking at values and how those inform landowner decision making. Go ahead and click it. Okay. So, uh, and to, to, this is a term we use a lot, we throw a lot of these terms around. In the social science world, just like any other science, we have to uh, make sure we, we legitimize ourselves and legitimize the salaries and, and tuition we charge. And so uh, there's definitions for these words that matter. Uh, so this, uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple of these. But values are desirable end states, modes of conduct or qualities of life that we individually or collectively hold dear, uh, general mental constructs that are not linked to specific objects or actions. And that's, that's important. Uh, freedom, equality, honesty, those type of things. These are really, we quite often we, we attach these to our identity. These are the things that 
we learn early on that we really say, you know, I'm a loyal person, I'm an honest person, and we, uh, uh, we think those really drive our decision making and our thinking. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, and so that's to, but we have to differentiate that between attitudes, all right? Attitudes, uh, favorable, favorable or unfavorable evaluation of a person, object, or action. So attitudes are specific. Attitudes need context. Uh, you can't just have a general attitude. It needs something to act on. Uh, and so uh, uh, when we think about the proximity to decision making that these things have, uh, it's important that we're looking at the right place. I thought the values were going to be the right place to look when it came to this, this critter. I was going to uh, decide whether these ranchers had the, the, uh, the right land ethic or whether they were thinking about profit or you know, more sort of altruistic means or, or whatever. Uh, so what I found was they actually all described, almost across the board, almost described the exact same uh, value set. There's this idea of this ranching way of life. Uh, it's about uh, family heritage, uh, culture, being a producer, honest day's work, all that sort of stuff. And uh, no matter where they fell down on this issue, uh, they almost all said that. So really what I found was uh, I had asked the wrong questions. Really when I went up there and tried to find out how values drove it, what I found out was that values didn't really drive it. Uh, you had people that uh, described the exact same value set uh, make perfectly uh, you know, diametrically opposed decisions when it came to conserving uh, sage grouse and, and oil and gas. And so there's something more to it, right? Uh, there has to be some sort of some more detail, some more context to the decision making. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, so uh, uh, this is a pretty common uh, diagram in, in, on these topics that. I uh, help to understand this, and so when we think about behaviors and decision making, uh, there is some some uh, uh, direct correlation between values and behaviors, but it's 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 tenuous. Really, what we see is we see quite a bit of of uh, uh, correlation between values and attitudes. Our values uh, really line up with our attitudes, uh, and our attitudes are generally a pretty good predictor of our behavior. But our values as a predictor of behavior is is tenuous, like I said. Uh, there's a lot of different behaviors. We're making decisions every day. You can substitute decision making for that just as easily. They're specific to situations. They're quick to change, and there's a ton of them. Whereas values are are very uh, straightforward, very uh, uh, very few in number, and we hold them pretty tight. We don't change them. Uh, so really, attitudes is something that that we tend to hear a lot more uh, uh, research being done on, uh, even specifically more more recently, and so. Uh, but even then, we start to run into some, some troubles uh, with, with those type of studies as well. So go ahead, Ben. So here's a, this is a kind of the, the classic example, and you can, you can, it doesn't, it's not hard to find these types of examples in the, in the literature. So this, I know this is kind of busy. Uh, this is a study that was done uh, uh, assessing attitudes of Iowa farmers and landowners, farmers up there as opposed to ranchers, farmers uh, towards all these different conservation issues. And so uh, the, these percentage, these are showing the percentage of people that uh, found them either extremely important, very important, or somewhat important, those darker colors. So we go down to protecting wildlife habitat, 26.5, 42, 26.5, over 75%, uh, almost 90% found those to be somewhat important or, or more important. Uh, restoring prairies, grasslands, uh, over 75% uh, found those to be uh, important as well. Now you go look at the landscape, and uh, you see a bit of a different story. Go ahead. So this is a picture I took, uh, actually on a recent trip, National Wildlife Conservation Initiative uh, meeting up to that, that very same area, uh, same place where they were sampling these, these folks. Now that's, that's beautiful, right? That's all, uh, you know, that, that field is almost nothing but uh, big blue stem rattlesnake master, master and liatris and all sorts of other cool and prairie plants. Uh, now do you think that's what the most that landscape looks like? Probably not, right? So this is a wildlife management area uh, that is completely surrounded. If I were to move the camera even a slight bit le left or right, it's completely surrounded by, by cornfields, of course. Where 99.9% .9 of the native prairie in that area, uh, according to the data they collected, is in agricultural production. So 90% of these people say that they have the attitude that wildlife habitat is, is important, and 75% of them say that restoring native grasslands is important. Uh, but there's a disconnect there. And that's a simplification of it, and of course that's going to be a surprise. Uh, there's all sorts of things that act on our decision making, whether it's uh, economics, uh, 
you know, the traditions, uh, the, you know, the, the easiest path, or sometimes you just simply don't know that uh, there's these other options and other things we can do. Uh, but the point I like to make with that is that maybe we're not always looking at the right thing. We can go out there and look at attitudes all day long, uh, but attitudes can be, can be somewhat fleeting, and they might not actually give us a, an accurate predict, predictor of uh, what goes on in the landscape. Let's go ahead. So I, in, in kind of perusing the literature, I've, I've well, I've spent probably too much time looking at this stuff, and uh, there's a couple of points that, that come up more and more often uh, the more and more you see this stuff. And these, these two are, are just the way I've kind of categorized it and, and uh, uh, simplified it. The two things that, that most often uh, predict the, the decision-making, that decisions that landowners are going to make or uh, really correlate to these two factors, how simple it is and how social something is. And I'll define what I mean by social in a minute. Uh, but the simplicity is uh, uh, shown by a couple of cool experiments that I really get a kick out of that show this well. So when we think about these two things, think about chocolate cake and, and fruit salad. You want chocolate cake, uh, uh, you know, that's going to be your, uh, if you have the choice between these two things, that's going to be your sort of uh, uh, you know, impulsive brain, that's what you're going to see, you're going to want that, you're going to desire that. Uh, but our forebrain, our, our frontal cortex, our, our more uh, uh, advanced brain is, might, might have some impulse control and decide to, to eat that fruit salad instead. So some researchers in, uh, with that being said, some researchers in Switzerland uh, did a study where they actually put, uh, they took grad students, and they put them behind a the door, a closed door, and they told them, uh, when they open that door, they're going to walk up to a table that has a box in it. They're going to have the choice between these two things. The catch is, when they're walking through that door and up to that table, uh, they, they didn't know what these are going to be. They're going to have to memorize a number of sequence as they walk up to it. Half the students got two-digit number, half the students got a seven-digit number. As they walked up to it, they read their number, and then they look at the box, and they pick what they wanted, uh, and then they'd have to recite the, the number off. 75% of the students that had the uh, seven-digit number chose the chocolate cake, whereas 75% of the students that had the two-digit number show, picked the fruit salad. You, what they, what the, the researchers figured is that uh, basically they're spending so much of their time, their faculties, that forebrain and critical thinking trying to memorize that thing, that they didn't have time to, to spend on, on thinking about the best choice for them. They went with their impulse, they went with the simplest Simplest choice, their, their gut reaction, which is chocolate cake. But the next one, Ben. This is showing another neat study that gets shown a lot in these kind of conversations is, uh, is this. And so this is actual data from uh, European driver's license offices. And uh, this is showing the uh, consent to uh, be an or organ donor uh, in European countries. Um, the blue is showing how many people, that's how many people consent to be an organ donor. The, the yellow are the ones that are there are they're very few. Uh, there's a pretty stark contrast. It's pretty clear. Uh, some countries, overwhelmingly, almost everybody does. Some countries, very few. When you look at these, you try to figure out, you know, is there some regional difference there? You know, economic, social, whatever. Uh, you know, there's not, not much. You get Germany and France, both similar sized countries, uh, geographically, you know, next to each other, and, and they both answered it completely differently. Uh, what you find out when you look a little deeper into this, the reason uh, there's, a, there's a main difference between two of these is really simple. Go to the next slide. But. So on the driver's license form that these folks check off, the, that, they, that they decide to consent, they either, they either have the wording for this question worded one or two ways. They either check the box if you do not want to participate in the program to be an organ donor, they check the box if you do want to participate in being an organ donor. So you either have to opt in or you have to opt out. Those folks that those countries that uh, showed high participation in that program all had that, uh, you had to opt out of it. So basically, just checking the box was, was too much. Either way, they were going to go with the default, default mode. So people want an easy button. That's simple. We all know that. And we all know also that when we're doing restoration, we're doing these major pro projects, um, there, there is no easy button. These are complex things, right? These are hard uh, projects to do. They take a lot of steps. Uh, they, they, they are complicated. You're going to have to spend time multiple years throughout different seasons and be, uh, uh, you know, be flexible. But when, when we get involved, as far you know, in, in terms of uh, people that provide tech guidance, government agencies, um, uh, we might not always 
uh, make it any more simpler than, than uh, uh, we might not necessarily keep this in mind all the time. We have a very common phrase that we go to, then go ahead. It depends. If you guys have ever been out with a wildlife biologist, you hear this all the time. When you ask a very, Landon asks a very simple question, you can't for the life of him give a simple answer. We always say it depends, and we, we reel off a, a litany of, of uh, different circumstances, uh, you know, different different studies, different literature, and uh, we we tend to lose them. And so uh, I've really worked on this personally and worked on, on stopping that. And we make the choices clear and uh, uh, and, and precise, and we've actually uh, adapted a, a financial incentive program following some of the same these same rules. And so uh, we've uh, developed a grassland restoration incentive program that uh, tries to cut through a lot of the the, uh, the sort of paperwork and bureaucracy that uh, a lot of the other federal programs have, trying to make participation as simple and straightforward uh, as we can make it. Uh, and we've had, hopefully, we think some some success in doing that. And so I just tell you know the biologists I work with to. I was, you know, give them a dirty look when they say it depends because we really got to get away from that. Go ahead. So the other, the other thing I mentioned was was social, and I don't mean necessarily social nowadays. It's kind of cliche to talk about social networks and, and that sort of stuff. Um, really, what I'm talking about is is uh, uh, social norms and how they affect uh, people and our decision making. And more and more, of the literature shows that this is incredibly powerful. We are going to act. Uh, how we think people expect us to act or uh, to avoid negative judgment of these types of things. So the rules of behavior that are considered acceptable in a group of society, people who do not follow these norms may be shunned or suffer some kind of consequences. Norms change according to the environment or situation and may change or be modified over a lifetime. Let's go ahead. So uh, a pretty simple example of this from the social science world is was done with uh, uh, hotel towels. So you know when you go to the hotel in the bathroom, the towels, there's, there's always a little sign there that says, uh, uh, please be water conscious, that sort of thing. Hang up the towel if you want to, uh, if you don't want us to wash it. So what uh, some, some uh, uh, researchers out of Chicago, uh, they ran a little social experiment, go on to the next one, and they hung two signs. The first one said, help save the environment. You can show your respect for nature. Help save the environment by reusing your towels. That's kind of the standard. End of line. And then they held a, so hung a different sign on half the other rooms that said, join your fellow guests in helping to save the environment. Almost 75% of guests who are asked to participate in our new resource savings program do help by using their towels more than once. So they added this social norm, they, they added this pressure, sort of a, an implied peer pressure uh, that, uh, uh, that everybody else was doing it, basically. Go ahead. And what they found was about a 10% increase in the people that uh, that, that participate and start hanging up their towels just by that simple wording, not even necessarily a real uh, normative pressure, but an implied one and an uh, assumed one. And so, uh, uh, pretty simple idea, um, but, but can have somewhat powerful uh, implications. Go ahead. And so, uh, uh, you know, when those of us that work in, the, in these rural communities, I think, see this uh, demonstrated uh, every day. If you want to know what's okay, in your town, what you're allowed to get away with, you just go ask these guys uh, some morning. <laughs> They're in every small town in Texas, uh, uh, sitting at the local coffee shop, the Brain Trust, and uh, they're dissecting everything that everybody's doing every morning. Um, but there's also groups that, that get together, wildlife management associations, uh, social clubs, uh, you know, KC Hall, big game suppers, and those type of things. Uh, and then neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor contact is, is so important. Any of us that work with private landowners have always heard them say, well, my neighbor said this, my neighbor said that. They, they take those words as, as gold and, and they, they're important. So we've had sort of a, one of our, uh, what we think is a bright idea. We'll see if we can get it off the ground. But um, to, to try to harness this, that energy, and uh, uh, we've, we've worked on developing what we're calling a conservation leadership incubator. Uh, where we take uh, uh, burgeoning, kind of nascent groups of, of private landowners that are coming together, uh, thinking about these things, working cooperatively to do these things, and provide them with capacity. We can't necessarily provide them with the spark because that's kind of what, what makes them successful in the per first place. So it's sort of organically, um, uh, locally driven. Uh, but what we're proposing is to provide them with uh, capacity grants, uh, funding, uh, mentoring, peer-to-peer -peer networking to help to foster them and uh, uh, develop them to develop their potential and, and try to uh, get some 
some delivery out of them. So to work with those social norms in a, uh, in a positive way and, and use it to, to our benefit. Uh, and so that's really where I wanted to leave it, just you know, simple and social. Uh, the two things that, that I, I've been preaching more and more, and, uh, and hopefully we can, we can all get a little better at doing this if we need to. So that's it. That's all I got. How, how, how much of, the, of their land are you talking to them about? Like just a percentage of it or, you know, the whole... It probably depends. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> yeah. Um, generally, we, we try to work with them to think about, you know, holistic coal property management. And, you know, uh, uh, what you're doing in this field can absolutely impact what you're doing in that field. And you can relieve pressure on this field by that working in that field. And um, we almost always try to try to think in terms of the whole property. Uh, most uh, the state agencies and folks who work with, with landowners in, in Texas at least will write a wildlife management plan or conservation plan that encompasses all your, your resources in your in your property. So, um, I've worked on agricultural or agri-environmental schemes in Europe and um, found that it's either the very wealthy or the very idealistic. They're easy to get, it, or they're the ones who will be first in to participate. But it's getting the guys in the middle. Um, and we, when we looked at the maps, we could see clustering. If you got the guy in the middle, because they don't relate to the very wealthy or the very idealistic. If you get them, you could we would see a clustering. If you got one guy, you'd get the other guys. They'd be looking. Oh, you had a good shoot on that, you know. But yep. because it's you know, but, but what are your experiences of how uh, uh, getting those people in? How how do you incentivize them? It's it's a challenge. It's, uh, we have the same problem.